Um, yeah, come up to the mic and, and share too. Yeah, get us started, Dan. Well, I mean, I think actually the kinds of um, of and, and, and uh, both of our well, both both uh, 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 Helene and Molly were, were saying that they they live in contentious environments, and I don't mean actually to make light of it, but we it's pretty clear um, from being here that. There's lots of, of kind of deep feelings in the science community, uh, uh, people studying, researching these issues. Um, and and that, that's not public controversy, but it is controversy. And it is unfortunate because it's hard to believe that that's an environment in which science, good science is likely to happen either. So we probably should try to figure that out. But it just wouldn't be responsive then to have a social marketing campaign for the public. I mean, that, that won't make your department meetings any better, <laughs> right? So we just want to do what Rick said, which is figure out what the, what is the issue? What's the problem? And then address it with the kinds of, of uh, strategies, tools that are appropriate to it. Yeah, Eric, you want to add to Yeah, Eric Sachs with Monsanto. I just wanted to pick up on this because I think, I think Dan's on to something. We, there, there's a large percentage of our of the publics who really are kind of undecided in this area, and I think that's kind of where you're at. whether they're aware of it or not, whether they care about it in the day-to-day -day lives or not, they're they're still in a camp where they haven't taken a position. The challenge I want to put on the for the panel to address is: so how do you take a topic like this and try and reach the publics and get them, you know, engaged based on on, on quality evidence? And, and I'll just use a case in point. Um, in the, over the last several, over the last month or so, there were a series of papers, um, uh, articles written right basically for the public uh, on uh, the Genetic Literacy Project. They were called Beyond the Science. And they were authored by scientists, economists, and uh, uh, policy, uh, I guess you'd call him a clusters or whatever you would call him, a policy and governance kind of public policy and governance person, they communicate a lot around framing and perspective in this area. But just using that as an example, how much of that unreached public will ever see that communication? And so how do you bridge that gap? That's my question. And do they need to? <laughs> Why would you want to? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I need to respond. Why would I want? Why, in other words, do we need to have the uninformed, unengaged, public engaged? Well, maybe that's another question. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a very good that's question. That's a great question. And keep in mind that when you, when you engage the public in a positive frame, know very well that the other people who are communicating about this will have to ramp up their game, too, in a nuclear war of communication about this issue. So mm -hmm. to think that you're going to be able to suddenly swoop in and completely change the debate, I think unrealistic at best. Um, depressing again at worst. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dan, go ahead and respond and then we'll move over to Just Bruce Briefly, Lee. but I, I mean, I, th this is consistent with what Rick said. Um, although I would say that uh, you, you don't, it, it, might be, it might be missing uh, the, the mark to think that, well, we need to uh, be sure that they get all of the information on the, uh, the, the science issues related to the risks and benefits of genetically modified organisms, it, that doesn't mean you're not, that, that people don't have a stake in information. Um, pe mo people need to, to, to recognize and act on the basis of far more scientific information than they can possibly comprehend and understand for themselves. Um, the main kind of information that they're getting is, information that helps them to recognize what it is that's known. Um, and most people get that from being situated in communities that are filled with people who have a, a lot of knowledge and who have a big interest in things and who evince through their attitudes and through their conduct and through their words that this is how it works. And actually, many of the worst kinds of problems that we have with science miscommunication don't involve people not knowing what the risks and benefits of the HPV vaccine. There are people being, being prevented from having a reliable view of exactly what those cues are that they normally process to good effect in their everyday lives about what it is that's known to, to science. And so what to do? 
you know, I always say, you tell me, because <laughs> I, I can tell you general things and you're doing something in a particular environment. Well, what do you think, you know, given what our, our general knowledge is will work? But here's the thing, you're, you're I know already um, that, that uh, companies here are learning that you go to the kinds of groups that have a big stake and you make sure that they know that their stake is being taken seriously. Um, because even if all members of the public aren't going to be GMO science literate, they are going to know whether there's something to be worried about in their community because those kinds of stakeholders are going to be evincing through their attitudes and words whether you're trustworthy. And so you know, make sure that you, you engage those people. Then you will be, be activating processes that will inform people of what they need to know about your issue. And I think a high quality public discourse about innovation in food systems is a critical public good. To however large that discourse is, the fact that it's high quality yep. really is a, a critical possibility and science communication is, is key. Yep. Yep. Yeah, go ahead, Bruce. Um, so at, at the risk of sounding self-interested, since I'm someone who trains science communicators, um, and at the risk of contributing to the nuclear war uh, uh, at, that, that Rick is worried about. It strikes me that one of the ways of responding both to some of Dan's concerns and to Helene's comment about sort of the extension system and staying in touch with all these different communities is precisely the thing that's come up before about an institutionalized science communication system of some kind. Because part of what institutions do, part of what I'm sure Monsanto and the, whatever the unnamed client that Steve Palacios was talking about yesterday was, is they've got a team of people who they've hired, mostly recent college graduates, whose job is to be scanning the environment, to be on social media, to be reading media, and just knowing where an issue is. Um, and then being ready to have a sense of which messages are beginning to bubble up, to know when it's time to conduct some focus groups in target audiences to figure out um, uh, what, what, messages, what messages, what frames might be coming up, both how you would frame them and how you, what, what alternate frames you might want to have, how to respond to frames that you think are going to be there, so whether you like Spider-Man or not. Um, so on. so I, in terms of a sort of a way forward, I think we have to recognize, again, this isn't a back pocket thing. This isn't something that we can just do because those, for, for most of the people in this room, it's not your everyday life. You want to be in your labs or you want to be um, doing your other things. There's a few of us for whom it's our everyday life, but I think there's an institutional need here. And, you know, Tiffany, we called out AAAS before, somebody else called out AAAS before as one potential place for this. In, in fact, the Center for Public Engagement is the beginnings of something like that. The kinds of activities that the Academy is doing are the beginnings of something like that. But those take resources to maintain as well. Yep. Great. Thanks, Bruce. Teacher? I, I want to push back uh, against a few things um, that have been said, and, and Dan knows that I'm going to push back against them, so it's not going to be, but, it, but a, a few of them, um, because I disagree, a few of them because they're empirically wrong. And, and the first one, <laughs> and, and, and the first one is, is something, I, 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 I think it's important for us, I mean, we've talked a lot about the uncontaminated communication environment, and, 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 and I think there's some truth to that along the lines of what Dan outlined. I think, though, it's really important, and I would love to hear what the, the rest of the panel has to say. You know, if you work at a university like Cornell or Wisconsin and you get regular emails that greenhouses are closed because somebody is, you know, has threatened to um, burn down yet another field um, if, if we close uh, all 500 million people markets um, and, and European regulators come out and explicitly cite the LOCI study as the reason for why that is, to treat that as a healthy communication environment, I would, I would tend to disagree with that. Um, I would also tend to disagree with the idea that um, if, if every new genetically modified food that is up for regulation is being labeled Franken, if that's salmon or anything else, uh, that then certainly that, and, and this is where, where my second point comes in, this is a, a very powerful replacement for information, and I, th I would urge us in this room, uh, we, I think we started out by, by rejecting a knowledge deficit model, and we're coming full circle back to it right now. Um, and essentially saying, look, it, 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 we just need to find a way for people to get more reliable information. 
Um, and, and, and the answer is there are 325 million people out there, Americans, and every piece of social psychology and every piece of communication and every piece of political science tells us that the way they make decision is by convenience. Um, and, and it's not that they're going to make decisions about Obama and Mitt Romney or whoever the next couple is going to be. Um, based on in-depth information searching. They're going to use heuristics, and they're doing the same thing for science. Now, not all of them. There are different groups of different publics, and very different communication strategies will be successful. But I would urge us to not come back to this idea that it's just a matter of providing information. It's very often a matter of providing a powerful way for me to make sense of something that's ultimately way too complex. And all of us have these areas. All of us are non-experts in most areas meaning we will have to rely on heuristics. How do I know that what Molly studies is scientifically sound? Because it's published in peer-reviewed journals, because she has an, a stellar reputation as a scientist, and so on and so forth. I have no, absolutely no way to judge the gray pages of Science Magazine for the most part. And neither do any of in this room, unless we happen to be in that area. So we routinely make, we do the exact same thing, make decisions, and yes, frames become unbelievably powerful shortcuts for all of us. And we use them all the time. And if I talk to you, Dan, and you don't get what I'm saying, I'm trying a different metaphor. I'm using a new frame, meaning we do the same thing when we talk to one another. So I, I really would, just in, in a sense of self-reflection, urge this room to not come full circle after however many hours we spend here together, back to the idea that, look, how can we just figure out to get better communication to, to people? Because if we've done that, then you know, hopefully we checked a lot of email along the way because then this was really was not very useful. So maybe that's a bit impassionate, but I, I, I was hoping to get the feedback from the panel on that. Yeah, I, actually, I have a question for everyone in the room, especially the panel on Dietram's question. It reminds me of um, after I had my children, I had major problems with my pelvis and my bone structure, and it didn't go back to where it needed to be because I had had kids. And I had to see a chiropractor for a year, every week for a year. And his theory was, your body keeps wanting to be where it was because that's where it was used to being. So we got to move it back, and then it would move back, and then finally it was all fixed. But it took someone to remind me not to be where I wanted to be all the time. And that reminds me of Dietram's, like, we all yesterday were like, yes, I hear what you're saying. It's not the deficit model, but we're pulled back to it because it's our natural place to be. So what's the chiropractor for us? What can we use as scientists in the scientific community? Like, what, what do we do to train ourselves out of this? Because you can all sit and think about it, and we get the theory, and we get the science. But is there something that we can all do to, I mean, look how quickly we came back to it, as Dietram said. We all were nodding yesterday about understanding the information, and now we do slip back into the net deficit model. How do you practically stop doing that? So there was a time when the academies, before they ever released a major report, would have a pre-release dinner in the Great Hall. Some of you may be old enough to remember those. It's been a while. Um, and we would convene, because I was working here at the time, we would convene about 100 people on all, all, pre all aspects of those, of those studies. Uh, the night or two nights before the report would be made available to reporters under embargo. Because our assumption was that those were the same people who were going to be called by reporters for comment the next day under embargo or for follow-up when the reports came out. And I have to say that um, as, a, as an intervention strategy, uh, proactive intervention strategy was more useful than the speeches we wrote, more useful than the news releases that we wrote, more useful than all those dog and pony shows we made, more useful than anything else we did was getting all the stakeholders together in one room let the wine flow liberally, and have discussions, and, and have a really full up, have the, had two or three members of the study committee walk through their report, talk about what the findings were, have a couple of, if there were members who had dissenting opinions, have them give their presentation, talk to, a, have a couple people from the audience who were identified as unhappy with the report, talk about why they were unhappy. These were always respectful and civil discourses. And I have to say that most of the time, those led to respectful and civil discourses in the public conversations that followed up. And it was very expensive to do, and very time intensive, and very labor intensive. And I understand why the Academy doesn't do it, but that's something that I would think that for this report coming up in particular, that would be a very good model to start that conversation. And in fact, that's exactly the tactic. It's the same tactic a different way in the three messages I put out there. It's sort of like the wine flowing liberally. It's a way of saying, 
Before we start a detailed conversation that may be contentious, we all care about food beyond its physical importance, and we care about that too. Nobody wants to wreck the planet. Nobody does. And diversity is important. Okay, now let's start the discussion. It's really exactly the same tactic as a, as a nice dinner in a hall where then um, exchange occurs. And my experience is not that that makes everybody in the room agree. And it doesn't necessarily make everyone care. They're like, check, 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 that was boring. Um, but it does tend to open up shared space. And what has happened there, and, and I have um, as you know, had some lovely you know, ponies and rainbows days and some really intense fights. What I find is the quality of the fight is better when we can acknowledge some shared commitments before we begin the really difficult dialogue. Great. Daniel, add something? Um, so uh, we heard at um, our breakout session um, about uh, the uh, email threats that were made against the, um, the uh, scientist who was the chair of the expert panel for the academies on uh, wild uh, horse population control in the western states. Um, I think we wouldn't infer from the fact that there are some people who sent her threatening emails that there's public division and polarization over wild horse population. People don't know anything about the wild horse population in general. Right? It's not like climate change, but yes, there are people who care a lot, and there are even some people who are being moved to make very inappropriate kinds of, of threats and what have you. That does not, it does not follow from that that we have a public that is in a state of division that is usefully kind of symbolized or brought to mind by this idea of the, of the contaminated science communication environment. Um, it's also true, I mean, social sciences tell us this, that, that there are all kinds of, of uh, biases based on heuristics, right? People, people uh, are hyperbolic discounters, right? That doesn't mean, though, that in every con context when people process information, we have to be addressing their hyperbolic discounting. There's no hyperbolic discounting problem with genetically modified organisms. If there's a problem, it might be with a problem that we understand because people are imperfect information processors. But let's figure out what kind of problem there is and not bring to bear on it just a broad array of things that we happen to know from the social sciences about how people process information. Right? No one here either, I don't know who possibly was resurrecting the, the information deficit model. The, the, the idea that people become oriented with respect to the best available information by processing what the, the kinds of competence that people they think have reason to know what's known are exhibiting through their behavior and conduct, that is a more realistic alternative to a model that says that a scientist says something to the citizen and the citizen processes it. And it's one of the things known by social science that you can end up having people's decision making defeated by having their heuristic reliance on those kinds of, of cues, which normally is reliable, be rendered unreliable and distorted by a science communication environment, one in which they live and when, where they look up to try to figure out what's going on. They're the ones who are seeing the messages. They're the ones who are seeing it's us versus them. No one is denying that this is a contentious issue for scientists. Nobody is saying it's good for someone to say Franken food, although actually Frankenberry cereal was very popular in the 1970s. <laughs> <That was> very <laughs> <laughs> but all we're saying is you know, know exactly what the question is and then get exactly what the evidence is that you need to answer it. Mm -hmm. Was there another, are you, yes, I didn't know if you were in line. Been hovering in the background. Yeah, um, I think there have been a lot of things that have been touched on here. I'm Kira Havens from Revolution Bioengineering. Um, to, to your point as to whether or not we need everyone to know about GMOs and what they do and what they are, um, and to whether or not that will just institute a nuclear war because the opponents will come right out um, and just ratchet up with you. Um, I believe that the the technology or the, the conversation about that te te technology, I think everybody can agree, has gotten very stale and is a bunch of talking points and bumper stickers that folks shout at each other in your, in your traditional 
discourse. Um, and I think the technology needs to be taken out of context. Um, and to answer your point about what is it that we do and how do we readjust ourselves and how do we move ourselves into a new position, I think uh, there needs to be an emphasis on making it accessible and making it tangible and making it personal. And this kind of speaks to Dietram's point as well about um, developing that framework for people to reference what is a GMO, what comes to mind when they think about it, what is the thing that they, that they see. One of the things that came out in the chestnut discussion was that this is, as purely an aesthetic consideration, this is very nice. Having a beautiful thing come back because it is uh, as a result of this technology, that is a new way to look at GM technology, and it's a new context where people can have maybe a more meaningful discussion that doesn't rely on those bumper stickers and those talking points. So that's kind of where I see the, the engagement and um, the more meaningful discussions occurring and maybe building a new conversation around that. Great. Thank you. Eric. Yeah. I decided to jump back in, maybe even follow up and, and respond to Rick. Um, I don't think I like the metaphor of nuclear warfare, but I take your point that engaging means all sides are going to engage and that it, it will escalate the conversation. Um, maybe that's what we need. Uh, maybe that's what we have. Um, I think my biggest concern about leaving a, uh, a disconnected public or publics uh, out there is that they're, they're ripe for somebody to frame. And right now, most of that framing is negative. We started the, the whole meeting with a negative frame. For those that are engaged and could articulate something, there's an, there is a negative frame. And so my question was less about the deficit model. It was more about how do you begin to adjust the frame, reframe, add an alternate frame among people who don't have one yet. I, I would like to echo that question, um, and I'd like to ask Dietram for help, because I've been at dinners where the person is genuinely asking me, is it safe? And they don't have an opinion yet. They're kind of on the fence. And it usually is someone that's worried about their kids, so that adds a whole new dimension to the level of fear that they may or may not have about feeding their children a GMO product. So if we're, if we're not going to go back to, if we're not going to use the data and the science to answer the question, how do we answer the question? This person clearly wants information. And I've had a couple of situations. One where it's at a dinner, they find out I'm the dean of a college of agriculture, boom, I get the question. But the other one is even with state legislators, people who their constituents are on both sides, and they are trying to make a decision. So what do you want us to use if we don't fall back on the data? That's, I need help. Yeah, come on up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Don't, don't, don't try to rebut what I said. <laughs> I will not address anything that Dan has said. Um, the, uh, no, but I think it, that's a really good question. And we actually just had a, had a, a Dominique was involved in it as well with, uh, with, with a DNR at Wisconsin um, um, asking about manure management, where that question also very often comes up. Um, you know, is it safe and is it not safe? And, and, it, and it's a very funny response that we have very often, and Dominique, as, as somebody who teaches risk communication, has probably a better answer than I do, but that we have a reluctance to actually make statements about safety because there's a margin of error, right? But if, if actually any person in the general population would ask us if drinking water is safe, we routinely say, yes, it is. Um, there's a different margin of error, but there's still a margin of error, right? There is a certain risk of, of drinking tap water, but we have no problem as scientists saying, yes, that's safe. Yet for other issues, we're much more careful to actually make that statement. Now, I'm clearly not a, a, a researcher in the area of GMOs in any way, shape, or form, so I don't know what those thresholds are and which areas we're talking about and so on and so forth. But I think the, we're, as scientists, very often we're, we're cautious about the simple answer that we would give for a lot of other things. 
Um, and that in many ways is a, is a sufficient answer in that, for that particular forum and in that particular area. Um, and I don't know, Dominique, if you have anything else to say, but it, it was very interesting for the, for the manure management in particular, that they were saying, well, we can't really, we can only talk about the risks, not about the safety. And that's, I mean, this is where the, where the early framing studies came in, right, the, the risk versus loss framing. Do I tell you when you get on a plane that you have a 0 0.0001 chance of dying? Or am I telling you they have an overwhelming 99.99999 chance of not dying? Um, it's exactly the same piece of information that I'm giving you, but it produces a completely different reaction. Um, and the same thing if I tell you, well, you know, there's a tiny risk left. Okay, why are you telling me this? And it, especially if you're a regulator or if you're a scientist, if there wasn't anything, versus you telling me that it's overall safe. So I think we're, we're it, I think the parallel to drinking water is a really interesting one because nobody would hesitate for even a second, yet we routinely hesitate for other things. Um, and it is ultimately, again, it's, this is actually one of the very early, this is where Kahneman's work on framing actually originated in that risk loss framing. Either way, dying is the frame. Say what is the frame? <laughs> Either Death. way, dying is the frame. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah. even more positive than we if, all like if, food. So, <laughs> um, can I just say about that? that like, because, um, this is can I follow up? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I was just joking. Um, <laughs> uh, but this, like, you, you don't like nuclear. Can I? Maybe you like this better. Rope a dope. Um, and this is actually a kind of. I'm, I'm hesitant to give this example because I think doing science and communicating are different, but every once in a while you get a kind of a freak of nature who could do both. And Randy Olson is like that. A scientist who did science communication really excellently with his movie Flock of Dodos. Right? What, what, he, he tells the story. There's this debate about creationism in, in Kansas. He lives there. He goes, oh, I don't recognize this. I live here. What's going on? So he goes to, to check it out. And what he finds is that these creationists have basically, their, their best weapon is the people arguing against them who aren't from Kansas and who evince this kind of contempt for them in answering all of their arguments. Right? Getting the, the, the people were not paying any attention. But once there was a debate, they didn't process what the content was. It was, oh, whose side am I on? Mm -hmm. And people who, who mis misinformers use the rope-a-dope strategy very effectively because they know you can't resist answering every point they make. This is what's going on with the climate debate. Right? This is what's happening with, with the kind of thing we're making mistake we're making about vaccines. So yes, you don't want to leave the public in a position where it can be misinformed, but it doesn't follow that the way then you inform them is like getting into a debate with people who are stating misinformation. Uh, you ask what to do, well, I don't know it, but here was a hypothesis. Go out there and engage the stakeholders, the ones who are gonna be the nodes in that network that will transmit to people that there's reason to be confident that the people that they're relying on are doing the right thing. Great, okay, I'm gonna turn it, Dominique, in one second. We have about 15 minutes before we need to adjourn. So I encourage folks, if they would like to say something, and just to even make a point, make sure that we're part of this discussion, <laughs> yeah, to get up and get in line. Um, Dominique, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on what Dietram was saying, and actually to build on Haline's point about, uh, you actually rightfully say, so if somebody comes to me with a question, how can I answer if it's not with scientific evidence? But let's not forget, and we tend to fall back to our initial assumption that this issue can be you know, brought down to very simple dimensions, environmental and health. But however, very often that's not always what people care about. People care about ethics, people care about corporation monopoly, people care about the right to know, people care about a lot of things. And for these kind of questions, I mean, misinformed, what does it mean? It's just a question of point of view. And so how do you answer that? And most important for all of us here, where we want to actually make sure that we engage in meaningful interfaces between life science and the public, those issues are at that interface. And so how do we do that? How do we actually bring to the table people that have those concerns and maybe are not eager to stand up and communicate? And how do we make sure that all those issues are brought and are part of that mini film dialogue? Open to the floor for you guys to think about it. Thanks, Dominic. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Schwab from Food and Water Watch, and I just want to make a comment or sort of an observation. It seems like in this session, and maybe some of the other sessions, the conversation is sort of devolving into how do GMO proponents win over consumers and the public or thwart GMO opponents? And I'm just wondering if that was the goal of this project. Um, 
it, I'm sure it wasn't the goal of this project, but you know, I also have to make the observation that I don't think there's a lot of scientists who are invited to this to participate, especially in the higher levels, who are concerned or maybe even critical about GMOs. I don't see them really anywhere involved in the panels, and I can't help but think that the conversation devolving the way it has in some ways may be a result of that. Um, and so just a suggestion, if you do another one of these, I think it's worthwhile to respect and include the diversity of scientific opinion, and there are many scientists who do have a critical opinion. Um, so just a comment. Great, thank you for that. Tamar, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah, first I'd like to second what Tim said. I think um, this has come down to framing, or what we're calling framing, a lot of the time. But I think we're blurring it a little bit, because some of what I'm hearing as framing is just basically you know, finding the right way to say the thing we've been trying to say for a long time. And that does go back to the whole you know, information deficit model. And you know, if, you're ta if you're talking about framing rather than just persuasion, I think we have to remember that it, that's rooted in this idea that we have access to something that's true. And it's really important that we be able to, to persuade other people that it's true. And I think we, it, it's, it's important not to forget that. Um, and rather than talking so much about framing and you know, what context can we give this fact that we're trying to convey, I think a couple of things have come up. And one was, was what Molly said about having a few points to establish a common ground, because I think that goes a long way toward having a more constructive suggestion. And the other thing is having a variety of viewpoints represented in the room, because the more I look at this, the more it seems to me that facts don't persuade people, people persuade people. And uh, you don't change people's minds um, if they're not in the room. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mark. Go ahead. Just following up on that, uh, the point about diversity of audience um, including different perspectives in the conversation. Um, it's good to see Food and Water Watch here. I had a chat with Jenna Reed earlier. She was in the mosquito session. And um, I think that it's really important to involve different people in the conversation. Um, I think that dialogue is really important. And that's one of the things I know we're you know, kind of hitting hard at the knowledge deficit models. But I think one of the benefits of taking that kind of evidence-based approach of information sharing is that you can sit down and have a chat and sort of depolarize and, you know, leave a lot of the the absence of common ground and the differences of values aside and actually look at things and try and be self-critical and self-aware of the own biases and values you're bringing to the table and sort of set them to the side for the minute and try and find where you can share a point of view on the evidence. So it's just my two cents. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, just as we're approaching the closing minutes, I've been reflecting on what's not been on, on the table mm -hmm. um, and it hits on a couple of the, actually the things that, um, that Tim and Tamar have just, just mentioned. One of them uh, is the issue of trust. Um, and there will be another workshop in a few months uh, on trust. So partly I'm just making a plug for it um, as a PILS member. Um, but, um, but we... We know there's this overall level of trust in science, but we also know that when we get into specific science areas or we get into the regulatory system and the under and that that there are it's a much more complex thing. And I think we don't actually know enough about that. Not just we haven't talked about it, but that may be an area where we actually need to do a lot more work. Um, the other one is something that's very common discussion in the science communication community is about storytelling and how to mix the kind of human-based storytelling uh, that, that connects people to, to these topics with the kind of systematic evidence that scientists um, believe they can bring to the, to the table. Though, that's a complicated issue, and it's one that I think we haven't talked about very much, that what are the techniques, what works, uh, whatever side you're on, but just how, where does storytelling and um, systematic data presentation come together. Great. Thank you. Jason. I'm thinking about uh, Helene's question when she's faced with someone who asks her as a kind of expert, well, you know, are GMOs safe? Um, and I was struck by how it kind of stumped us all. Oh, gosh, what are we supposed to say? And I think the reason it stumps us is because we somehow forgot the lessons that the def if the deficit model isn't sufficient, 
then the answer to that question is not, let me tell you what I know. What if the answer to that question is, instead of answering the question, engaging the person saying, well, what do you care about and what do you know? And let me tell you what I care about and what I know, and let's have a conversation. So if you reject the, the way that that question is posed to you, which puts you in this place to fulfill the deficit model, if you refuse to participate that way, then you actually have an opportunity for engagement where you might learn something too. And if we all took that stance, it, it might be interesting. One of the highest costs or a high cost of this situation is in, I think, almost a generation of scientists about my age, typically a little bit older, who literally can't do that <laughs> because they're so injured by this by their, the roles they've played in this debate, that kind of dialogue is not accessible <laughs> to many of the for, of the pioneers um, who who really built technologies, and um, and I, I I see those injuries and their costs, and it's it's a serious issue. So those of you who are my generation and younger, you know, there is a difference in that sort of second gen, next gen um, versions of these conversations that I think are really important. They may be nuanced, they may be complicated, not everyone may care, but f food is something everybody cares about in some form, one way or the other. Great, good comment. Trevor. A um, uh, well, couple of points. Uh, I think one of the things that I've got out of this is that the knowledge deficit model does apply. Uh, and it applies to scientists about the social science of communication. Um, and, and I think that also speaks to the multiple different audiences uh, that we have to calibrate uh, science communication towards. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, in New York, uh, a lot of people I know who were not scientists, but who were you know, philosophers or what have you, were very intrigued by Nicholas Nassim Taleb's uh, critique of, uh, G, uh, you know, on t in terms of precautionary principle thinking, the critique of GM. And Taleb is a vicious interlocutor. He is not a pleasant person to argue with. What they didn't have, they didn't have a good response to that. There was no good response to why, yes, we understand his mom, we don't understand, are his premises wrong? Uh, did, he, did he make critical mistakes in biological modeling? Now, that's not an audience you'd necessarily think uh, is, is important in this debate, but actually uh, in terms of uh, you know, the, the, who, who these people are, uh, actually it might be because they, they're editors uh, at publications, they have very influential social networks, they engage on Twitter, so uh, that may actually require a very high level engagement. Uh, um, but at the same time, I do want to remind uh, that there were, you know, there were in interesting, I I'd like to see these meetings with maybe philosophers and technologists come to talk about these problems. But, and one of the reasons why is that I'm reminded in this talk about uh, we must get engagement, we must listen, uh, uh, that yes, uh, the philosopher Stuart Hampshire said that the principle of justice I I equals the principle of reason. Reasoning, that is, you, everybody, each one of us reasons pro and contra, uh, and in order to have a just society, there must be some way of people articulating uh, their, their opinions. But at the same time, we should also be reminded that, um, and, and this may well be a, 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 an example of what Isaiah Berlin said, was that there are certain values in democracy that are not commensurable, and we're, not, we're always gonna have conflict. Um, and it simply may not be possible to argue with some of the stakeholders in this. It is maybe a case that the stakeholders don't even want to engage, they want to win. Um, and those, I think, also require uh, thinking about where does science, what, what role does science play in that? Does it, does it stand forward, does it stand back, does it leave it up to the politicians? But uh, you can't win every argument by reason or facts. Thank you. Did you have a response, Dan? Oh, okay, great. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> yeah, oh, sorry, Rick, I didn't see you. Please. So in response to several of these questions, I have three very quick takeaways. One, messy science always leads to messy communications, and every new technology always starts as messy science. And that was a clear takeaway from our conversation in Jason's group with Monarch Butterflies and BT. That was messy science to start with, and that created a messy communications environment, never recovered, and I would argue that 90% of all new technologies will start the same way, so gird your loins. Second, I think, I don't want us to be using the terms persuasion and engagement simultaneously to mean the same thing in this conversation. They're not the same thing. 
you need to be persuade you need to be able to to put yourself at intellectual risk to have true engagement with other parties and I have seen very little evidence in this meeting or in the conversations in general that people are willing to put themselves at intellectual risk on these issues. And that's a consequence of the kinds of issues that are there. And the last thing that I would observe, I think with respect to almost all of these, is that there is almost no scientific issue, certainly no science policy issue, for which the vast majority of the public is not informed, is not framed, is not, doesn't care one bit about what we're doing, and GMOs falls in that category. I mean, there are times when it will become salient to someone when it is salient to them right then. It, they don't spend their nights worrying about most science issues. And I think to the extent that we believe that we're gonna create the world to be safe for science by the way we communicate, particularly by the way we communicate after eighth to 12th grade, I think we're being very naive. Thank you. <laughs> that, and with I gotta that, say, though, yeah. that is the joke is on. But you see, I have to say, like, you laughed when the point was made about the, 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 the uh, knowledge deficit uh, theory applying to natural science. It, it wasn't a joke about scientists. <laughs> it, it was the jokes on the people who were doing the science of science communication. Because we keep telling you the facts about how people <laughs> process information. Because they think that you're just going to get it if we just keep telling you over and over. <laughs> Who's studying us and laughing at how silly we are? But, you know, so the, the, the one thing that we all know, um, we know it generally, even if in particular, as we lose sight of it, is that we got to rely on evidence, right? So the only thing always is just always to ask yourself, you know, do I, what, what do I really have basis for believing this and, and what, would I, what could I possibly be missing? You know, what could I observe that would give me confidence that I'm not missing something? Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, so that's a great um, uh, final thought to lead to, I think, uh, you know, the way to kind of think about this meeting is the Pills Roundtable is, um, you know, our charge is to help explore this interface. And we're a collection of individuals. Very few of us actually have done work on the GMO issues before, but we wanted to um, you know, bring together folks to think about this interface on this topic specifically. And I would say to that point of the, the deficit model with natural scientists or social scientists that the healthy and non-polluted science communication environment starts right here <laughs> among us. And I think this gathering has been a good start to do that. And I can't think of um, many gatherings in the past 10 years where this collection of people gets together to share these kinds of things. So I think this is the optimist part of me, believes this is a really great start to start sharing that deficit model um, or not. So I really appreciate all of you investing two days of your time to be here. And to Dietram, who was the chair of our committee, and our other com our, the chair of this committee, and our other committee members who are here, Sarah and Fred, and to the National Academies, and especially to Keegan, who is the project director, who tirelessly has pulled us together to make this happen. And Lauren, for all of her administrative work to make this happen, and schedules, and making sure the AV goes well. So I understand that um, the videos will be available. Thank you. <laughs> the videos will be available um, online within a week or two, um, some time frame. So we'll share that out. And we invite you all to keep the conversation going with all of us. And we look forward to a healthy, non-polluted science communication environment. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs>